the propagation of uncertainty in network summaries, really what I'm getting at are why aren't network statistics accompanied by uncertainty statements? Right, so I'll get to that in a little bit. Um, here's the outline for the talk. I'll give just a little bit of an overview here, trying to set the stage as to why I have the, the tongue-in-cheek title that I do. Uh, and then I'm going to try and give you a sense of some of the work that we've done in the area in the last five years or so in my group. Uh, and we're beginning to make progress. We've got a couple papers on the probabilistic side of the problem. We have a recent paper on the statistical side. There's lots of work still to do just on this problem, I think. All right, so complex networks analysis, complex networks as opposed to regular or standard networks, I guess, uh, from uh, 30, 40, 50 years ago, right? Complex was a term the physicists lent to this area. Uh, Network-based analysis was traditionally very small field, right? It was actually, if anything, even subfields, right? Um, and then around the mid to late 1990s, there was this epidemic-like spread of interest in it, right? And there are a handful of really seminal papers in 1999, 2000, 2003, et cetera, that really helped launch some of this. Um, can, uh, you can lift a pint and sort of discuss why you think this might be, but I think two of the things that are really important is one, if you look sort of at the history of science, we've moved very much towards a systems level perspective on nearly everything that we do, right? And networks are sort of a fundamental way of representing systems. And secondarily, we have a flood of high throughput data going through all kinds of disciplines, right? So we have all the World Wide Web type data that drove a lot of the initial work in this area. We have an enormous amount of biological data that has driven it. Uh, recently, I've been working with people on what they're now calling high throughput chemistry in imitation of the biologists. So high throughput, high throughput, high throughput. The idea that you can measure uh, a large portion or perhaps all of the elements in a system and therefore in some sense measure the system. Right? And if you can measure it, then we might think about modeling it. <clears throat> so it's been almost 20 years. Uh, a lot has happened. Every once in a while I go to Google Scholar, I stick in network and I restrict to title. And it comes back, this was maybe six months ago, and it told me there are about 500,000 articles uh, since 1999 with the word network in the title, right? So there's an enormous amount. And contributions have been from pretty much everywhere you can think of, right? So where's statistics in all of this, right? And I would say everywhere, right? Really, it's everywhere. Um, but where have we been as a field? Well, much less until maybe the last five years or so where we've come really sort of uh, come into our own into the field, right? Um, if you look at network analysis and you compare it to, say, time series, spatial, or whatnot, right, there are sampling and design problems, there are descriptive and visualization problems, there's modeling inference prediction, right? All these sorts of things that are canonical paradigms in the way we think, right, are also represented in network analysis usually with a twist, right? And it's the twist that makes it so interesting, I think, right? <clears throat> so a lot of this work uh, has been in non-statistical areas uh, of varying depth. Some of it is quite deep. Uh, some of it is, is sort of an initial take on things. Um, things that we would call statistically foundational in nature, I think, are actually still lagging. I think in some ways, ironically, the statistical foundations of this area are being laid now uh, in the last five years or so and continue to be laid despite having already done so many things in this area. All right. So I'm going to try and talk about one thing that I consider a foundational topic that my group has been working on. Right? Here's the problem at 10,000 feet and then we'll drill down a little bit. Right? So the common modus operandi, if you want, in network analysis, right, from an applied point of view, right, you're an applied researcher, you have some system of elements and the interactions that interest you, right? Consider Facebook if you want, consider the World Wide Web, consider a gene regulatory network, whatever is the, the example of choice for you, right? You identify what you mean by elements and relations, you collect data, corresponding to those elements and or those relations, right? It might be microarray type data, it might be scraping a website or something like that. You represent the data via a network, right? That's sort of the key defining characteristic of what we're doing here. And then you summarize or you utilize the network. And typically you give some sort of numbers. The network has this density, it has this many triangles, it has this, that, that, et cetera, right? It sounds good, right? In fact, probably about 
at least half those 500,000 papers do that. But I'm going to state something sort of obvious to all of us and ask a question, right? which is if there's uncertainty in the determination of the edge status or maybe the vertex status or both, right? if there's anything that's unknown about that network, right, then that uncertainty propagates through any calculations to some extent or another when you use the network graph as an input. Okay? But there's really surprisingly very little work done. Right. So this is sort of, this is a slide that's connected to the tongue-in-cheek aka on my title slide, which is why aren't there summary, why aren't there uncertainty statements associated with network summaries? We produce network summaries all the time. Right. <clears throat> so I'm not the first to acknowledge it, right? but out of 250,000 papers or more, right, one would hope that it would have received more attention. Right? So the work that I think needs to be done is both on characterizing how this error propagates depending on what it is that you're computing from the graph. And then if it's desirable, perhaps adjusting for the error, accounting for uncertainty and whatnot. Okay? So I would say this represents a major foundation missing in network science. Okay? <clears throat> now there's a couple ways one might think about going about it. Right? One way is to take a model-based perspective and there, there, this is one of the areas that we've been particularly active in as statisticians, right? And from, a, particularly if you have, say, a Bayesian perspective, right? You create a posterior for the network, right? And then you go through and you can, any function thereof, in principle, you can create uncertainty intervals, right? And those are as good, up to as good as we can model networks. And unfortunately, although we've been quite sophisticated, current wisdom still is that we have a long ways to go. So I'm going to take a different perspective, right? I'm going to take more of a frequentist-based perspective for this particular talk, right? And I'm going to be looking to try and do the following. Given some sort of input data, if any of you have worked in computational biology, you recognize a heat map, right? And these types of things are showing, for example, the strength of activity of various genes as a function of different experiments. Right? From those, we have a zillion and one ways to create networks. This is a very simple one. This is just a correlation network, right? And from this correlation network, I can work out the density as 0.14. And what I would like is 0.14 plus or minus what? Something. Okay, so that's my goal here for the talk. Right. So if you look at why we're not able to make those statements, why aren't they as easy as taking a confidence interval for the one sample mean? in introductory statistics, right? Because everybody these days practically is learning how to do that, right, in the era of data science now. I would say there's maybe two reasons. One is, in some contexts, error rates are low or perhaps even ignorable, right? And secondarily, it turns out estimation is actually hard. This is one of those project areas where I thought, okay, well, let's get going. You know, I signed a PhD student, figured, you know, we'd hammer out something in about six months, uh, and then reality kicked in. <laughs> okay. But it's been very interesting. Um, we have two things we've looked into regarding uncertainty propagation. One is probabilistic characterization for low rates of errors. Right? If you're in context where you don't have much error, you still have some error, how is it behaving? Right? And then secondarily, statistical estimation, in particular, trying to identify when is it possible or impossible. And when it's possible, what can you do? Okay. So my agenda is to basically unwrap those. In both these contexts, while you could think of many different ways of summarizing a network, we're going to start with sort of the, the, the most obvious starting point, which is network subgraph counts. Because if you're counting, then you might hope that they're going to behave like averages of some sort and then they might behave like something familiar. Okay. All right, so I'm going to talk about this in two stages. One is probabilistic characterization, then the other is the estimation. <coughs> All right, so let's put a little notation to this. All right, so I'm going to call G a true underlying graph. Uh, for the sake of argument, I'm going to let it be undirected, uh, not multi. A lot of these things, of course, you could generalize. And then I'm going to let f of g be some network summary characteristic of interest. 
geography. In principle, it's whatever your favorite one is. My favorites today are going to be ones that are in the form of counts. Okay. So when restricting to the counting problem, basically we have some sort of subgraph H that we're interested in counting, right? And up to isomorphisms, we're simply summing over how many times do we see copies of that in the network. However, we don't get G. That's the whole point. We get some observed version. I'm going to make my life a little easier and say we actually do know the vertex set. Right? So there's sort of versions within versions nested here. I keep drilling down to the simplest one I can't solve. Okay, and that one's taken me a while already. Right? So we're going to see an observed version where there's some uncertainty in the edges. And we're going to model it marginally by saying that I have an adjacency matrix Y, right? where for the ith and jth vertices, right, I'm going to see either a 0 or a 1. Right? And that's Bernoulli in both cases. But the noise is going to be built in with type 1 and type 2 error rates alpha ij and beta ij, according to whether or not there truly is an edge or, in fact, there is not an edge. Okay, so it's a lot of notation there, but all it's saying is that we have bit flipping, as the engineers would say, right? We're flipping bits, right? Zeros can become ones, ones can become zeros. Okay, and you have to be a little careful here because it depends on which of these sets you're in. All right, so the goal here that I'm going to set for ourselves for the moment from a probabilistic perspective is to understand what happens when you are just using what people are doing in the literature and they're just calculating the numbers and then they're putting them out there, right? If I did want to know how are those numbers behaving, right, <coughs> I'd like to characterize the distribution. Right? So I want to characterize the distribution of, in this case, the discrepancy between what I think I'm calculating and what I actually am calculating. So here's where we've done some work. This is joint with a few folks. Uh, There's a JLMR paper we had with a postdoc and a student of mine. Uh, and then more recently, there's a journal applied probability paper uh, with Han Gao at Northwestern University. Okay. So we're going to focus on large graphs. That there's a sense of asymptotics here, and the asymptotics is in the, uh, the order of the graph, and low error rates. Okay. <coughs> in a nutshell, this is what's going on. Right. The discrepancies between what you think you're calculating and you are calculating right, under certain conditions are going to exhibit Poisson-like behavior. Right. But more formally, they follow what's called a skellum distribution. Right. And a skellum is a difference of Poissons. Okay. So if you want to sleep for the next 10 minutes, you already got the message. Right. <laughs> I just flew in three hours ago, so if I go to sleep, please wake me up. Okay. <laughs> All right, so here's some assumptions, right? Large graphs, number of vertices, NV goes to infinity. Edge unbiasedness, right? This is very helpful at the beginning. We're able now with the work I did with Han to uh, generalize that. But this says that the total type 1 error and the total type 2 error is balanced, right? And we'll just call it lambda. Okay. And then finally, we're going to say we have a low error rate. So if we let mu be the average degree, then we're going to lambda e big theta of mu. Okay? Doesn't vary fast, doesn't vary slow, it varies basically just like. And then frequently what we tend to do is we make an assumption of homogeneity. Right? So homogeneity then says that the type 1 error is independent of which vertices I'm talking about, the type 2 error is independent. Right? So within the JLMR paper, there's sort of layers of theorems. Right? I'm only going to kind of show you just theorems and talk about what they're saying to us and all. But typically, there's ones that deal with the general case, right? And then we have results that say, if you have homogeneity, we can actually interpret it a little easier. And this is what it says. Yeah, please. Um, so when the graph grows, you only control um, mu as the parameter that goes with it. Then match lambda will be to some degree. Am I understanding it correctly? So other than that, there's no model. That's right. Other than that, there's no model. That, yeah, that, that's very important, right? So I am not taking a stochastic block model. I'm not taking a graph on. I'm not doing any of these types of things, right? All of those would be things that are models for G. Whatever you have, conditional on G, I'm only interested in modeling the type 1, type 2 error. 
And one can, of course, then build in a model for G as well. From that, you would be able to at least, uh, with high probability, talk about the properties that you're actually after. And then you might make statements as to how close you are. Right? But our, our analysis here is just conditional on G. Please. Here, do your uh, mu depend on M or in some way? Um, it can, yes, exactly, it can. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm balancing to give this talk in terms of trying not to put too many details and too much and whatnot. But yes, implicitly, right, because this is what's changing, right, and we have some sort of rate argument here, ultimately these are all being coupled together to the asymptotic scenario. Yeah. Okay. All right, <clears throat> so here's a key observation. When you're doing subgraph counting, right, this discrepancy D that I was talking about can be written in this sort of form, right? And if these indicators that you see a copy of H prime, right, in the observed graph, and you see a copy in the true graph, right, if these have relatively low probability and you have a lot of them that you're counting, then you'd expect each of these to be roughly Poisson, right? And so if they're roughly Poisson, then their difference should be what the difference follows, which is a so-called skeleton. So here's a skellum distribution. How many people have heard of skellum? Okay, yeah, that's okay, that's all I have. I had only heard of it because in another research lifetime in the early 90s, I had done work on wavelets, and I got interested in doing wavelet analysis with count data. And again, if you're gonna start with the simplest problem you can't solve, you start with Haar wavelets, which basically, when you look at Haar coefficients, different, they different sums. If you have Poisson data, you're differencing sums of Poisson. I said, huh, I wonder if that has a distribution, right? 1946, I think, Biometrica paper, if I recall correctly, uh, Skellum published on this, right? <coughs> so, mm -hmm, yep, yep, and um, uh, there's a bit in uh, various areas of signal processing as well, right? So it's not unheard of, it's not unheard of, and it's becoming, you can see the ramp up in utilization and citations but it's still not particularly common. So your skellum distribution really is just characterized as the distribution of the difference of two independent Poisson, right? So in particular, your expectation is the difference of the two rates, right? Because we had this uh, edge unbiasedness, this means that in our case, we're gonna have mean zero, right? And the variance is gonna be the sum of the total type one, type two errors, okay? And the distribution will be symmetric in the case that we have this edge unbiasedness. All right, so here's a theorem. And again, pardon me for, for, for combining things and compressing them a little bit here. Please do ask questions if it feels like I'm, I'm skipping something important. But my main goal is just to tell a story here. Details are in the papers. So under the assumptions here, and for the moment, independence among the errors, right? Then the kolmogorov smirnov distance between a skellum, right? And the discrepancy in counting edges Right, is going to vary like one on number of vertices. Okay. And this is for both sparse and dense graphs. Right. Yes, please. How does the constant depend on you? Oof. How does the constant depend on you? So this is using Stein type arguments, right? So in this case, uh, the constant is not depending on you. Yeah. Okay. In the case of dense graphs, right? Oops, I'm sorry. Yeah. So when we take this result then and we compare it to say normal distribution, which is the other thing you would think to look at, right? <coughs> we have another result here which says how do we compare to the normal, right? So if you take the discrepancy in edges, you normalize by the appropriate variance, right? And you compare to a normal zero one distribution, <coughs> right? Then you get a bifurcation in terms of sparse and dense, right? So in the case of sparse graphs, right? You're able to say this is somewhere between one on root log n and one on log n, right? Compare this to your one on n, right? So this is your lower bound telling you this is much, much slower, meaning effectively it's far away, right? In dense graphs, you get a big omega here, right? So it's essentially telling you that it could be better, it could be worse, up to the what we can do with the analysis, right? It's not gonna be any better. So these are simulation results. There's a bit more detail here probably than I want to go into, but this is taking a look at what happens when I change the way that the error rate lambda 
and the underlying average degree mu relate to each other. I go from a constant right to a log. Log is sort of what really I'm implicitly assuming in the theory I'm doing. And then I say, let's crank it up and let it be square root or even linear. Right? And as you do this, right, this is showing log base 10 of that Kolmogorov Smirnov distance. Down here is better. Right? And it's saying basically this is as you change the number of vertices, you're seeing that pretty uniformly you're doing much better with the skellum until you hit a linear relationship. And then it's close to equal. Okay. So probably with more work, if one was probabilistically inclined, right, there's much sharper results that you can do that. Right. That's the main message here. The other part of the story I want to tell, this is the part, the first, the first part was not that hard. It was you know, maybe some few months work. Right? <laughs> the other part <laughs> was a couple of years of work, largely because we didn't know what we were doing. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, which is often the case, right? <laughs> so <clears throat> we said, what happens if you have dependent errors? Because right? everyone kind of nodded their heads with independent errors. But you can almost guarantee that in a lot of cases, realistic, you have dependent errors, right? So it's either in the construction or estimation of your observed network, or it's in fact due to the fact that you have overlapping subgraphs that you're trying to count, right? So if you're doing a gene regulatory network inference, you're doing something even just as simple as a correlation network, right? And I have the expression at this gene, and I want to see if it's correlated. I'll calculate the Pearson correlation with the expression at this gene. And then I'll calculate the same thing with the expression of this gene, and this gene, and this gene, and this gene. Well, of course these are dependent, right, just by construction. Similarly, suppose that I actually do have independent bit flipping on the edges. Suppose it's actually true. But then I count triangles, right? And so this triangle and this triangle are sharing an edge, right? So they're dependent. So pretty much as soon as you either go toward dependency in construction or anything higher order than counting edges, you're going to have dependency. Okay. Nevertheless, a skellum approximation can still be applicable here. Right. You have to have a suitable notion of weak dependency. This is where using Stein-type arguments comes in. Uh, the reason I say we didn't know what we were doing is there are elegant ways to use Stein arguments and much less elegant ways. You can guess which one we used. <laughs> okay. Fortunately, I met up with Han Gan. Han is a Stein theorist. And uh, we, the, the second paper I referenced there is a much, much shorter one with much, much more elegant proof for a much more general result. Okay. Isn't always the way, right? <laughs> All right. So what we have is general results on differences of sums of binary variables that are correlated in different ways. They can be correlated within one count or another, and they can also be correlated across. Okay. Um, so we have several types of these bounds. We control the Stein constant in particular, right, going back to the other question. And then we illustrate on some simple network models. All right. And so this is just one result. Again, it's compacting a couple other ones that have much more detail in them. And it just says mm -hmm. that if the edge indicator variables corresponding to non-edges and corresponding to true edges <coughs> satisfy certain dependency conditions. If you know this area and you know things like, um, uh, what am I thinking about, positive association or negative association, for example, this is an extension of those ideas. Right? As I said, you need both within and across to be able to have a fully general model. If they satisfy these types of conditions, then you have a similar result comparing the discrepancy of using a skeleton, which you'd like to use as your approximating distribution, to the edge counting, and it varies in this fashion. Those familiar with uh, Stein-type results for the Poisson random variables will see that this looks very similar in nature to them. Basically, if you drop these twos, then you essentially have uh, an analog of Poisson-type results. Okay. All right, and there's simulations, of course, as well, if one wants to look at that. So this gives us some insight as to what's going on. I'm continuing to work with Han in our project for the summer, which I'm optimistic will actually only be a summer project because he's optimistic, <laughs> right? <laughs> is that we, what we're going to do is look at higher order subgraphs for both normal and skellum, and basically try and carve out the analog of what we have in a great deal of detail right now for random graphs, right? So random graph problems where you have one coin flipping Right, traditional Erdős-Renyi 
there's a great deal of detail known about subgraph counting problems. Right? This is deceptively similar to them, but it's not the same thing. Because you have two coins going, right, depending on which the edge status is. Okay? And we'd like to deal with ones that are dependent right, for practical reasons. All right. The other thread that we've been following ever since we first started working on the probability was, so you have a skellum distribution. Okay, can we use that to create confidence intervals? Right? And even more, what if your edge unbiasedness is not true? Then you would need to first correct, ideally, right? and then do some sort of uncertainty quantification. So this is joint work with uh, Chi Wei Yao and um, uh, Jun Chang Chang. Right? Um, so what can we do to do better? Right. I'd like to eliminate edge unbiasedness. I'd like to actually estimate the type 1, type 2 errors. Propolist is assuming we have all these numbers. Statistician is assuming we have none of them. Right? And then I'd like to produce uncertainty statements for these rates and whatever the, the network summary is of interest. Right? So we've made progress on it. This is an archive paper that's available uh, if you, you want to take a look. I'm going to reformulate the problem a little bit. It really is just a notational sleight of hand. Okay. So I'm going to say that the true adjacency matrix I'm going to call A. Right? And again, I'm assuming I know the graph. I'm oh, sorry. I'm assuming the graph is fixed. Right? So the adjacency matrix is fixed. <coughs> what I observe is Y. And I'm going to write this in terms of random variable epsilon where the epsilon has this odd sort of three-point distribution, right? where basically on one is the mass for a type one error, on minus one is the mass for a type two error, and on zero is the rest of the mass. And as I said, it's a sleight of hand. It's exactly the same model as before. It just allows us to write it in a way that kind of breaks these apart and puts in the AIJ explicitly. So it looks kind of almost like a regression-ish type model. right? Or another way, you might think of it as a mixture model. It turns out the mixture model is actually a more powerful way to think about it. So we're going to make the following two assumptions, and I'll remark later where and when we can loosen those up a touch. Right? So we're going to assume constant marginal error probabilities. So it's not alpha ij. It's just alpha everywhere. It's not beta ij. It's beta everywhere. Right? And we're going to assume here an independent noise again. Right? We'll go back to basics, just like we did with the probability argument. So first result is to ask, is estimation possible in this setting? Right? And the answer is typically no. Okay. So that was, that was a little, uh, hmm. <laughs> I thought, oh boy, we're in for another three-year project. This is not good. Right? My students are going to flee me. Right? So <clears throat> let's let M be the class of all models in this setting right? where we have A, we have beta, and we have alpha. And then we're going to let epsilon be the class of all measurable functionals of the data y. Right? So we're back to generality again. We will return to only counting subgraphs. But for the moment, this is a general result. As right? long as whatever your favorite summary statistic is, is a measurable function of y, then this is applicable. Right? So for any subgraph count f, right, if a certain number is greater than 0, which it typically is, then we have the nth soup of this particular probability of the discrepancy of estimation being bigger than that is bounded below by a half. So I would like to get consistency of estimation as a basic property. That would mean that this is going to become smaller and smaller, ideally as I get a bigger network or whatever I mean by more data. Okay, And I'm taking a, d a number that I'm bounding away from zero and I'm saying, that overall estimators over this entire model class, this thing is not going to get small. Okay, so it's essentially an impossibility theorem. Okay, this number here, this that, that comes from it uses uh, a result of Lacombe where you're uh, you're uh, setting up uh, a calculation that looks at the smallest sum of type one, type two errors over a model class. And as often these things, you make a guess as to kind of what are going to get you to your extremes. And a sufficient way to get to the extremes is to look at a certain no notion of a dual model, 
The dual model takes your adjacency and it flips it so that you have edges where there are non-edges and non-edges where there are edges. Okay. And then the rest is just a bounding argument. Okay. So it's telling us that what I set out to do, we can't do. Right. So I guess we can quit now. No, sorry. Actually, we worked this out. So we can't do this. So there's a couple ways that you might proceed here. This previous theorem is saying basically that from a single noisy observation, you can't do the estimation here. So one can either put more information into the problem, right, in the form of, say, a prior, right, and go a Bayesian direction, right, and certainly that's been done. And certainly if you can make statements regarding the correctness of your model in the prior, you can use consistency results for your posterior of some of what exists in the literature to uh, presumably create consistent results here. On the other hand, if you don't feel comfortable doing that, then you might ask yourself, what happens if we have replicates? Because sometimes we do. And if we do have replicates, how many do we need? Right. So notions of replicates do exist. Uh, computational biology, I learned early on when I, uh, I've done work for about 10 years with people in that area, and very early I learned that they love three. Right? They love three. Okay. Why? because it's more than two, but only by one. <laughs> and they know that with two, if you're estimating a mean and a standard deviation, you're just changing numbers around. But with three, it's the first non-trivial estimate of mean and standard deviation, right? So you can find three microarrays, for example, routinely in uh, the databases, okay? Similarly, in computational neuroscience, they, might, they may not be independent replicates, but very often we see longitudinal type measurements. fMRI studies, for example, are one, uh, one illustration. Right. So in a nutshell, with as few as two to three replicates, estimation is possible. And we can say all the sort of standard statements we're used to saying with the subgraphs that we've studied so far. Right. So let me show you what that looks like. Okay. Go back again to counting edges, only we're going to normalize here, and this is going to be the edge density. Okay, or otherwise what people typically call the network density. Okay. Let's do two versions. One is we're going to say, nature told us, I'll give you a parameter. Not A, that doesn't count, <laughs> right? But alpha or beta, if you have A, you can compute your parameter, your delta, and you're done, right? So I'll give you alpha, I'll give you beta, which one you want, right? So we're going to say we want alpha here, right? You can do a similar thing with beta. I like saying alpha because in the example I'll show you later with gene correlation networks, there's a couple ways that people often go about them at 10,000 feet. There's a lot of regression-based methods and there's a lot of testing-based methods. With the testing-based methods, at least nominally, you start by controlling a type 1 error. So at least nominally, you would claim you know alpha or at least an upper bound on it. Okay. So suppose this is known to us. And then let y and y star be IID replicates from this model. So we've been talking about y the entire talk. I'm just adding one more copy now, one more random copy. And then we're going to define estimating equations. Right? There's a little bit of work here, obviously, behind them. Yep. Right. But with these estimating equations, right, these are unbiased or asymptotically unbiased, depending on some of the caveats I'll give you later. We have two estimating equations. The first one is just based on the mean of the overall data. Right? The second one is based on the average absolute differences. Okay. And these absolute differences are either going to be 0 or 1 or minus 1. Right? So they're quite simple. Right? And the absolute would just be 0, 1 then. So we have a theorem then that says if you assume alpha is known and you define method of moments estimators of this form, are functions of alpha u1 hat and u2 hat, right? then assuming IID errors and assuming that neither asymptotically the, the fraction of edges nor the fraction of non-edges goes to an unreasonable extreme. Right? So they're both going to infinity. Right? Then this joint distribution estimating beta and delta goes to asymptotically in number of vertices, it goes to a normal distribution, mean zero, and with the covariance that we can, we can characterize. Right. If we assume that both of these are unknown, 
then we need two replicates. With this other replicate, we can define a third estimating equation. Right? You can see there's, again, a sort of similar nature to it here. And if you start, for example, with an algorithm that says take an initial value of alpha zero, use the previous two equations, given those estimates for beta and delta, plug them in to get an estimate of alpha hat, iterate. Okay. Then you can similarly show that under the same types of conditions, again, you have now a trivariate asymptotic normal distribution. Okay. All right, so some quick remarks. Uh, I'm nearly out of time here. So you can get standard approximate confidence intervals for alpha, beta, and delta now from the asymptotic normality. Okay. The assumption of independent noise is not strictly necessary. Right? As long as you have uh, dependent noise that allows these moment equations to hold up to a uh, one on root n term, then you should be able to work this out. Okay. And consistency also doesn't need to have pure replicates. Again, if you have the adjacency matrix underlying your replicates being nearly the same, where again it depends on n, then this will go away in the wash. Okay. So we had a small simulation study. Uh, I hadn't planned to tell you about it anyways because uh, it was a massive table of numbers, right? Uh, and I hate showing tables of numbers. But the story emerging from it was that for true replicates, pointing interval estimations seem to work very well. Interval length, of course, is decreasing as NV is increasing. It decreases very quickly, right? Estimation of beta, not surprisingly, becomes harder as the network becomes sparser. You're just seeing less and less cases of true edges that could have become false edges. Right? And introducing pseudo-replicates, right, with this theta one I showed in the previous slide is now less than one. This seems to primarily disrupt the interval coverage. Right? All right, so let me give you a quick example, and then I'll wrap up here. Right, so I already talked about how in computational biology you can often get three replicates. Right? So we use correlation networks based on 153 genes deriving from 40 experiments, right? and they're each replicated three times. We controlled the family-wise error rate nominally at the 0.05 level through a Bonferroni correction. There are, as I said, a zillion ways you could go about changing what we did here. We took the simplest one we could think of. I have three networks, so I can get three densities if I wished. And those are 0 0.073, 75, and 74. So they're all saying about the same story in terms of density. Those are estimated densities. Right? These are what would be quoted typically in a paper, although you would presumably put it all together to make one network. Okay. If I say I know alpha, right, because I controlled with the Bonferroni correction the type 1 rate at 0 0.05, I have just shy of 12,000 tests, so nominally I have a rate on the order of 10 to the minus 6 for alpha individually, edge by edge. Okay. When I do the estimation with that known alpha, I get a beta hat of about 0.45. So you have nearly 50% chance of flipping true edges. <coughs> Delta is now about twice what it was here, and the confidence interval is quite tight. Okay. On the other hand, if I say, Maybe nominal is important as a word here. And maybe, right, and there's a lot of literature actually to support this, that that type of control is not what we think it is. So I'm going to go ahead and estimate alpha anyways. I get a value of 0.024, about four orders of magnitude larger. Right? That, of course, impacts type 2 error. And it adjusts the estimate of network density down to about 0.067. That's maybe not so far from 0.073 until you look at the 95% confidence interval. It comes up at an upper bound of 0.072, saying it's fairly sure that these are actually off. Maybe not by a lot, but they're off. Okay, okay so we've extended these things a bit uh, to higher order subgraph counts for chains and cycles. Um, in particular, this allows estimation of two stars and triangle counts, and you can work on the so-called clustering coefficient of networks. But the covariance expressions are complicated enough that a bootstrap procedure is necessary here. And bootstrapping in this problem is turning out to be really hard. It does look like there's something we can use out there. And so we are part of my current job when the workshop is done is to go over to LSE and work with Chiwe for a couple of days and try and hammer that out. 
right? If people are interested, I can talk later as to why, why that's hard. Right? Bootstrapping in networks in general has proven to be quite hard. There's a handful of things that have made some uh, important progress, but that's a huge area. Okay, closing thoughts. So I started with big picture. I'm gonna return to big picture. Network-based perspective and modeling analysis is really pervasive now. You even find books in the humanities almost entirely on networks. Um, we've had 15, 20 years, but really it's important to sort of revisit the foundations. I have a small mm -hmm. monograph that uh, came out under the Bernoulli Society uh, lectures last spring, where I basically decided to, to really get brave and actually put this term I've been using in talks for a while on the cover. And uh, the book is essentially subtitled Revisiting the Foundations. That really what I feel like we're doing as statisticians now in a field that's 15 years old and working on problems and many others like this. Right? I think the hook, I think maybe this is why so many statisticians are now in here, is that the twists on these seemingly familiar problems are interesting. They're hard in many cases, but interesting, right? And just in case uh, a little pressure helps you, uh, when I'm done here in London this weekend, I go to Lausanne, where I'll hang out with a bunch of signal processing people. Graph signal processing is also skyrocketing in the engineering literature, where they're working on very similar problems using very similar techniques. So the engineers are on our heels, folks, right? <laughs> okay, and with that, I'll stop. <laughs>